My name is Stephen Donofrio, and it's my privilege to welcome you all to the launch of Supply Change, Forest Trends' new project, which we're launching in collaboration with our partners, CDP, Ecosystem Marketplace, and WWF. Before we begin, we would like to thank those partners and our donors and supporters, the Climate and Land Use Alliance, Global Environment Facility, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Profor. Also, we are very appreciative to the efforts of, the, of our creative communications partner, Think Parallax, which has worked tirelessly with us to produce the website and reports we are launching today, and our web launch host, which is, of course, Sustainable Brands. So as an advisor to the Supply Change Project, I've been with the team here since the project's inception nearly 12 months ago on high-level conceptualization and strategy development, and on coordinating partnerships. It's my pleasure and honor to be able to work with such a diligent and intelligent team at Forest Trends, which I credit greatly for all the excellent work you'll hear about today. Please contact me should you wish to discuss how your organizations could work together with supply chains going forward. I'm here to provide an overview of the agenda and to moderate the Q&A segment. So please feel free to send those questions into the chat box throughout the web launch. We'll get to them after the speakers have presented. And I should note that any questions that we are unable to get through live, we will do our best to follow up by email afterwards. So the agenda works as follows. We'll start off with introductions from the organizations that are the brains behind supply chains, after which we'll find out how supply chains can be put to work from both a company and an investor perspective. So let me briefly introduce our speakers. First, we'll hear from Molly Peter Stanley, who is the director of Forest Trends Ecosystem Marketplace, where she coordinates the publications, outreach, team, and resources required to publish free environmental market intelligence for carbon, water, and biodiversity interventions. She has led the development of numerous publications, including the State of Voluntary Carbon Markets, State of Forest Carbon Markets, and the World Bank State and Trends of the Carbon Markets Reports from 2009 to 2014. Next up will be Katie McCoy, head of the Forest Program at CDP. Katie joined CDP in 2013 following the transfer of the Global Canopy Program's Forest Footprint Disclosure Project to CDP. She has been with the program for five years and became head of the program in 2014. After Katie, we'll hear from Jeff Malcolm, Director of Private Sector Engagement, World Wildlife Fund. Jeff manages WWF's relationships with McDonald's, General Mills, Sealed Air, and many other corporations to advance sustainable operations and sourcing. Along with managing partnerships, Jeff oversees WWF's Business Services Department, which manages WWF's data and internal operations for business engagement. Jeff has been at WWF since 2008 and has been WWF's global lead for certification and standards, developed WWF's supply risk analysis, and was part of the, teams, uh, the team that developed the WWF's water risk filter. For the company perspective, we'll hear from Fiona Wheatley, Sustainable Development Manager of Marks & Spencer. Fiona has a wealth of experience of the retail sector, having worked for Sainsbury's for almost 20 years followed by a period at John Lewis Partnership before moving to Marks & Spencer in 2011. Fiona believes that only through collaboration can we find solutions to the complex and deep-seated challenges affecting society and the environment. And this philosophy underpins her approach in, in introducing industry-leading sustainability policies for seafood, timber, palm oil, and soy. She leads policy development within the Consumer Goods Forum, as well as m and and, uh, as well as MS, and participates in various advisory groups on sustainable commodities. Fiona coordinates the MS WWF partnership programs on cotton, water, fish, and sustainable consumption, and leads the MS Plan A strategy on natural resources. And last, but certainly not least, we'll hear from Gabrielle Toomey, who is the Senior Sustainability Analyst at Calvert Investments. Gabrielle works on the environment, water, and climate change team, integrating financial analysis with environmental, social, and governance factors. At Calvert, he engages corporations on financial materiality of their sustainability practices, including emission reductions, greening supply chains, and sustainable land use. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Molly Peter Stanley, who is the Director of Ecosystem Marketplace, for her opening remarks. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and thanks to all of you who've called in today to learn about this exciting new project. Um, also, a thank you to Sustainable Brands for hosting this webinar and bringing in so many listeners from relevant organizations and companies. I also want to thank our partners in this research who joined today, WWF and CDP, who you'll be hearing from in a moment. 
Um, this project wouldn't have been possible without their collaboration, their data, their networks, and their insights. I wanted to first take a moment to talk about Forest Trends and its other project, Ecosystem Marketplace, which is what I direct, um, and is sort of the third party to the supply chain collaboration. Forest Trends initiated supply change a year ago, this month exactly, actually, um, with support from the Climate and Land Use Alliance. Forest Trends itself was founded in the late 90s, though, to support the growing, the growing global network of decision makers aiming to mainstream forest conservation in business and policy and investment decisions. Uh, it was hoping to address questions about the best way to protect critical ecosystems, and in particular, of course, how to pay for it. Um, several years after forest transformation and in the midst of the, emerging, uh, the emergence of the global carbon market and increasing interest in environmental markets, Forest Trends launched a project called Ecosystem Marketplace to track all of the private payments that were made to mitigate carbon emissions, to protect biodiversity, um, to manage or restore forested wet watersheds, et cetera, et cetera. So the businesses and investors, and of course governments too, had some sense of how actively the private sector is paying attention to its forest-related regulatory and reputational risk. The assumption at the time, of course, was that policymakers would take on a greater role in ensuring the protection of critical ecosystems um, so that this wasn't at the mercy of fluctuating economic and business environments. We've seen those processes move forward in the UN climate negotiations at a pace much slower than anticipated. And while progress is being made, many of us in forest finance have, have been left wondering what alternatives exist that will drive companies to incorporate forest risks into their procurement and investment decisions at scale and in the present day. Um, this is why companies began shaping, this is why when companies began shaping and describing their sustainability pledges in terms of ecosystem impacts, we all began to pay attention and realize that much like the state in which we found the carbon markets over a decade ago with lots of innovation, but little transparency and liquidity, that this space also needed aggregated information of the kind that ecosystem marketplace has traditionally provided to other markets. All of that said, we've learned a lot of lessons from our first go around in the carbon markets, as have many people, um, where many information providers competed with conflicting information and created markets to repel corporate attention and action. Um, this time, we've teamed up with some of the leading influencers and other data owners in the world. Uh, and we're very pleased with our early products that are the reflection of all of those ideas in uh, in a very sort of united way. I hope you'll be happy with the product as well. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the first of our supply chain collaborators, TDP, which is represented by the head of their forest program, Katie McCoy. Katie, take it away. Thanks very much, Molly, um, and thank you all for joining today. Um, so just a very brief intro to CDP for those of you who are not familiar. Um, we're an international nonprofit organization. Um, our vision is for a global economic system that operates within sustainable environmental boundaries and prevents dangerous climate change. Our theory of change is that the process of disclosing information to CDP incentivizes companies and cities to measure, manage, and reduce their impact on the environment and build resilience. By providing this high quality information to the market, we are changing the way business, investors, and cities behave and accelerating the transition to a sustainable economy. More specifically from our forest program point of view, our vision on the forest program is to remove commodity-driven deforestation from corporate value chains and improve global understanding of deforestation-related risk. Through our forest information and request and scoring process, CDP seeks to drive companies to adopt actions that ensure a sustainable production and or procurement of, um, of main forest risk commodities, those that are on the screen, timber including pulp and paper, palm oil, cattle products, and soy, in their own operations and supply for investors and other stakeholders, including policymakers. CDP's forest program seeks to support companies in their journey to achieving deforestation-free operations and supply chains by encouraging the continuous assessment of key data points for each of the four forest risk commodities through our annual disclosure and investment process and assessment process. In 2014, over 160 companies disclosed to our forest program, and over 50% of those did so publicly. 
So we ask for this annual information on behalf of investors. And in 2015, our information request has gone out to over 700 global companies um, on behalf of 298 investors representing 19 trillion in assets. And really what we're aiming to do and what the data collection and the data points enable both investors and companies to do is, aren't, and is help to address these key critical questions that you can see on screen. Are any of the company's operations or critical suppliers exposed to deforestation risks? What systems do the companies have in place to manage their supply chain and ensure traceability of products? And how confident are they that they're going to have access to the quantity and quality of commodities required to operate now and in the future? And as Lucia from Green Century Capital Management, one of our investor signatories, puts it, rigorous and reliable disclosure is critical for our investor signatories to understand how companies are managing risks, to separate the leaders from the laggards, and to make informed investment decisions. And as Lucia explains here, her company is using our, um, our disclosure platform for help, to help inform investor engagement with companies. And I just wanted to you know, comment a bit on the partnership that we have here on the supply chain and our involvement in the supply chain project. Thank you for Molly and Stephen for that excellent introduction. Um, CDP's publicly reported data has been used as part of the supply chain website. And for companies that disclose to us, this means that they're being recognized um, and, and encouraged to publicly disclose their progress. And as Paul Simpson, our CEO, puts it here, we're seeing increasing awareness of the impact of, on businesses of deforestation risk and recently a growing trend for commitments to combat this. And we're delighted that this new initiative further underlines the need for consistent corporate disclosure to CDP on the impacts of deforestation. So um, I'd like to say thank you to our um, core spon sponsors of our program and then hand over to Jeff Malcolm from WWF. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. It's great to be here today and to represent WWF as a partner for this beta launch of supplychange.org. Let me just move the slides back. I'll begin by reflecting on the, the cover from The Economist in September of 2010. It shows a magnificent image of a macaw flying over a forest and includes the headline, The World's Lungs. It's a beautiful image, and it highlights the necessities for forests, or forests for the oxygen we breathe and the carbon they sequester. But of course, the headline doesn't tell the whole story, as forests are much more than just our pulmonary system. Forests are home to about 80% of terrestrial biodiversity, species such as orangutan, mountain gorillas, giant otters, and Siberian tigers exist within the broader system, ecosystems that forests maintain. Thousands of insects and avian species are part of the integrated fauna and flora systems we see in such amazing places as the Amazon, the Congo Basin, the greater Mekong, and the Russian Far East. And forests are also needed for materials that humanity uses. The wood we use to build houses, paper we use for printing, and nuts we eat come from forests. They provide recreation for hikers, campers, skiers, and other outdoor enthusiasts. And for some people, forests provide a home. While most, if not all of us on the call today, live in metropolitan areas, the forests are home to indigenous people and others that depend on forests for their livelihoods. In short, the forests provide a vast array of resources to all of us, including food, wood, medicine, fresh water, and the air we breathe. Without the trees, the ecosystem that supports the human population can fall apart. But the threats to the world's forests are large and are growing. Expanding agriculture due to increased population shifts in diets is responsible for most of the world's deforestation. The threats are so severe that we are losing forests at the rate of 48 football fields per minute. The Amazon, the planet's largest rainforest, lost at least 17% of its forest cover in the last half century due to human activity, mainly clearing trees to create new or larger farms and ranches. Illegal and unsustainable logging, also resulting from uh, demand for cheap wood and paper is responsible for most of the degradation of the world's forests. And this degradation and deforestation can disrupt the lives of communities, sometimes with devastating consequences. For all these reasons and many others, WWF has been working to save forests for over 50 years. WWF is a founding member of the Forest Stewardship Council, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, the Roundtable on Responsible Soy, and the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And 
Today, we are proud to be a partner for the beta launch of the SupplyChange.org website. WWF believes that deforestation and degradation must be and can be stopped, and the, pri the private sector plays a crucial role in this. We also believe that transparency towards actions to stop deforestation and degradation are needed, and SupplyChange.org will play a crucial role in this by aggregating information and showing progress towards commitments that have been announced. The species and people that depend on the world's forests, that is, all of us, need us to act. And WWF is proud to be part of this initiative to stop this deforestation and degradation. There is much more to do, of course, and we look forward to working all, with all of you further on this. Thank you all for being with us, and I'll now turn it over to Molly from Ecosystem Marketplace. Thanks so much. Um, great to hear from both of our, our partners on this project. Um, by now, I guess you have a good idea of who our collaborators are um, and also some idea of why we launched Supply Change. Um, so let me introduce this next phase of the discussion by introducing the, um, the sort of market context for Supply Change. Um, as you'll see throughout our website and the report, commercial agriculture and irresponsible forest practices drive at least two-thirds of tropical deforestation. This data point actually comes from another piece of forest trends research that attributes the worst of these forest impacts to uh, demand for and production of palm oil, soy, cattle, timber, and pulp. Um, the same crops are key inputs to hundreds of millions of everyday products from snack foods to shampoos and underpin a significant volume of supply chain greenhouse gas emissions. Coincidentally, these are the same four commodity groups that organizations such as the Consumer Goods Forum, who you'll be hearing a lot about, as well as our collaborators have identified as critical to target for support to companies that are seeking to eradicate deforestation from their supply chain. Um, jumping right into the findings from our inception report, which is based on our initial data set of 243 companies that have made 307 commitments, exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, obviously, this is not the um, this is not the universe of commitments that are out there, but these are the ones that we were able to identify based on different criteria for this project. Um, here, you can see that actors at every step of the supply chain are taking ownership of their role in commodity-driven deforestation by publicly committing to reduce the ecosystem impacts of the commodities that they produce or that they procure. Um, figure. Uh, figure one shows uh, how these commitments have changed over time. Um, here you can see that worldwide, companies with a total market capitalization of at least uh, four trillion have announced commitments. At least one third of those new pledges were made in 2014, uh, which nearly doubles 2013's new announcements. The largest number of new commitments addresses ecosystem degradation from palm oil production specifically. Um, which saw a 171% increase over commitments that were made in 2013. Um, palm oil commitments consistently dominate our research, particularly uh, partly due to RSPO's member progress reporting requirements and the fairly intense civil society attention to this sector. Uh, and I'll talk about RSPO, the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil, in just a moment. So the question is, which kinds of companies are making these commitments? It's probably no surprise that we found that well over half of forest risk commodity commitments tracked are from food product manufacturers, food retailers, restaurants, and agricultural raw producers, which are increasingly responding to downstream pressures. Um, here, large retailers are particularly active. Uh, interestingly enough, our data reveals three new upstream commitments from suppliers for every one commitment from a major retailer, such as a Marks & Spencer or Walmart. Um, before we move on to, to deeper findings, let me talk for a minute about what we mean by a commitment. When the supply chain team was compiling data on each commitment, data from our partners, um, but also uh, digging through hundreds of public documents, um, to answer questions like, will a commitment address multiple commodity liabilities or only one? Will it apply to some product lines or all of a company's brands? Will it extend to suppliers? Here you can see the typical parameters of a commitment that they found, um, which detail what commodities and entities are affected, the scope, timeline, procurement criteria for commitments. 
Um, for example, companies typically specify timetables for achievements. These are known as time-bound commitments, um, which are bookended by baseline dates and also target dates and may additionally set some interim milestones uh, on the way to full achievement. Uh, with respect to what are, are labeled here as procurement policies, um, we will be increasingly differentiating between something simpler target language uh, and the procurement policies that they, they actually set out formally that give those commitments some teeth. Um, figure four gives you an idea of how commonly some of these different terms are cited in commitment language. Most companies describe both what they are committing to, uh, for example, the protection of high conservation value habitats, and also their procurement policies for target achievement, for example, purchasing certified commodities. Um, or uh, purchasing um, products for which no burning was incurred. Um, procurement policies can also help bridge the gap from a commitment start date to the ultimate achievement. Um, for example, half of all commitments aim for traceability, which is the ability to trace a product ingredients back to the forest or the field where they originated. Um, you'll also hear uh, later and also see in the report that two out of three commitments pledge to source commodities sustainably or responsibly. Um, while this is seemingly non-specific, um, many such commitments, well over 200 in fact, defer to a deeper certification policy that relies on their suppliers to adhere to certification principles and criteria to uh, assure environmental, social, and economic soundness. Um, in fact, and, and we deal with this a lot in the report, um, four in five companies rely on third-party certifications, such as those administered by multi-stakeholder roundtables, like the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil, the Roundtable on Responsible Soy, or from other entities such as the Rainforest Alliance. Um, you'll recall from WWF's presentation earlier, several of the um, multi-stakeholder initiatives that were mentioned. Um, in Figure 5, you can see uh, the sort of full spectrum of certifications that are tracked in the commitments that we've documented. According to the number of commitments that promise to source commodities that have those certifications attached, um, or in some cases, the source commodities from suppliers whose facilities have been certified. Um, it's actually not quite that simple, though, because right now, finding and purchasing full aggregated certified commodities, the actual physical commodity, um, can be difficult and costly in the absence of any sort of mass consumer or retailer demand for those products. Um, until these commodities are more available and affordable, producers can instead receive credit, uh, such as Green Palm for palm oil or RTRS credits for soy in return for generating one ton of certified commodities. Um, companies can then purchase these credits to support sustainably grown commodities without having to in any way modify their actual procurement practices to somehow take physical delivery of certified commodities. They might never take ownership of the actual certified products, but the credit purchase itself still rewards the producer for certification and it lowers the buyer's barriers to certification in the absence of widely accessible supply. Um, the volume of credits transacted uh, actually trumped that of the volume of physical certified uh, commodities that were traded in 2014, as you can see in another figure in our report. Um, these transactions represent a small but growing proportion of global palm oil and soy demand, which is at roughly 9% and, and 1% respectively as of 2014. The supply chain documents well over 300 unique commitments um, as we said, at least 30% of these were established in 2014, and one-third of them cite 2015 as a target date for achievement. Um, this means the 2015 outcomes will be a very critical indicator of the efficacy of these voluntary efforts. This particular deadline is largely reflective of civil society guidance, I'm sure you can imagine. For example, WWF began in 2009 calling on companies to achieve 100% certified sustainable palm oil by 2015. Um, we see a lot of, of those particular actors in our data set. Separately, um, the New York Declaration on Forests, uh, which came about at the UN Climate Summit uh, in 2014, identifies 2020 as an achievement signpost. Um, here are several companies and 
uh, and dozens of governments echo WWF and the Consumer Goods Forum in their aim of zero net deforestation by 2020. Um, from here, our report looked briefly at company performance against their commitments. And, and that's a very complicated topic to discuss in a short period. And so I encourage you to look over those pages. Um, to date, though, I will say that just over one third of companies have publicly reported the extent to which their 23rd activities are actually compliant with their targets. Um, to this end, in 2013, companies reported an average of 72% progress toward achievement of their relevant sustainable commodity goals, um, irrespective of the target year or the commitment type. Uh, by commitment type, I mean that um, while this proportion most often describes the actual purchase of certified commodities compared to their targets, uh, it could also mean that they've mapped 100% of their supply chain for a particular brand, or maybe they have an average of 95% assurance of legality from a particular region. Um, so when we talk about achievement, it's not always as simple as being able to talk about it in terms of, of dollars and cents or um, or percents and market share, um, because sometimes the, the goals that companies are setting out are, are not necessarily easily quantified. Um, and so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, this final figure, and, and then I will turn it over to my colleague Ben to talk about the website and what you can find there. Um, this, this figure looks at the influence of various civil society organizations, which have been very significant players in supporting companies to develop these commitments and, and ideally to helping them uh, cross the finish line uh, in 2015 and the years leading up to 2020. And here you can see that um, it's not as simple as one company committing to uh, the targets created by a particular multi-stakeholder initiative. In many cases, companies are influenced by over a dozen uh, different multi-stakeholder initiatives reporting guidance um, and, and strategy documents and um, different declarations that they're signing. Um, this is just a handful of the different uh, influencers that we track. Um, and these organizations were chosen because they had three or more members who were in our data set um, that had commitments. Um, and so one of our biggest recommendations uh, for this research product um, is for organizations to move toward harmonization of the recommendations that they're making and means by which they will support companies to, uh, to achieve their targets. Um, so with that, I will close. Um, I encourage you to check out our website, which you're about to get a walkthrough of. Um, we will be updating it on a regular basis, and so there will always be something new if you come back to visit. Thanks very much for your time. I look forward to being in touch with each of you. Hello, I'm Ben McCarthy. I've been with Ecosystem Marketplace for a year and working on supply chain since September. I have two roles within the project. Uh, first is one of the researchers reading and analyzing the individual commitment texts that are the building blocks sitting behind the project. And second, working with our designers and developers to produce the report uh, and this web platform. For this walkthrough today, we'll spend a few minutes to navigate uh, through the home page, uh, a commodity specific page, a a uh, commitment profile or two, and then we'll cl quickly highlight a few of the auxiliary pages. We are in beta, as I want to point out, uh, so if you see any omissions or discrepancies uh, or have any helpful suggestions, feel free to email us at info at supply-change.org. As we scroll through the pages, the navigation uh, menu on the left will stay with us. Our goal was to present a clean and easily accessible tool. Uh, we've provided links throughout the platform, though, uh, to delve deeper into the issues. Um, the uh, relevant news uh, and events are presented here, and immediately below that, uh, we begin presenting the project data. Um, each of the analysis uh, on the home page is relevant across commodities. Uh, this is a flexible space. Uh, where we can examine data uh, we've collected however the community finds most useful. Uh, on almost every page, uh, we present uh, a profile filter uh, that lets you sort through all the uh, profiles presented on uh, supply change. Uh, you can sort uh, the profiles uh, by sector, by region, or any of the various criteria. 
Uh, again, just to point out, we are in beta, um, so feel free to contact us. Uh, now we'll look at one of the commodity specific pages. Uh, these pages are laid out similar to the home page. Uh, we offer a breakdown of the number of commitments uh, made to a specific product type. Uh, quick mathematicians uh, might notice that the total product type commitments add up to more than the number of profiles. That's because supply chain has recorded some entities with multiple commitments for the same commodity. Um, the analysis on these pages are specific to the relevant commodity. Um, in the second figure here, we introduce the commitment and procurement policy criteria that supply chain has tracked. These criteria developed organically uh, after reading literally hundreds of commitment texts and recognizing the frequency of use for these particular criteria. Um, here again, we have the option uh, to delve deeper uh, into the data, and we encourage you to explore. Um, the filter does allow us to search uh, directly, and I'll do so uh, here. When the logo is clicked, uh, you get a uh, preview that displays some basic company inf information, um, lets you scroll through the commitments that have been made, um, and then proceed to the full profile. Uh, each profile, um, again, has this general business information, um, but uh, includes involvement in related activities, such as multi-stakeholder uh, memberships, disclosures, or declaration uh, that supply chain has tracked. Relevant assessments here are those scores, rankings, or credentials conducted by third party that supply chain is aware of, uh, such as uh, CDP Forest Program Sector Leader um, or the WWF scorecards. At the center of supply chain project are the commitments that we've tracked. Uh, each of our researchers has uh, summarized uh, the commitments in a standardized format. However, we don't expect you to take our word for it. Uh, we provide links to the source document for each commitment right below the summary uh, where you can make your own interpretation. We also document any milestones uh, towards the overall goal and list them on the graph below. Uh, when progress is made, uh, when progress towards a commitment, excuse me, is available uh, through public documentation, such as sustainability reports, CDP disclosures, or roundtable submissions, uh, we list those on the graph as well. Um, any uh, volume data um, that is available, uh, we present the most recent year here. Uh, the supply chain researchers have poured through the commitment text uh, and supplementary documents to determine if the tracked criteria were explicitly mentioned within each individual commitment. Uh, we've done our best to factually record uh, which criteria the companies convey as part of their commitment. We're not making any claim uh, that any particular criteria should be included or that one approach is better than another. Um, however, uh, we just want to provide uh, context around the conversation within the community. Finally, uh, as additional resources, we link uh, to um, as resources associated uh, with the profile and, and any specific news uh, where the company is mentioned. Uh, in addition to the profile filter, uh, we are able to uh, scroll through a list of uh, companies profiled. As another example, I'll just bring up Marks & Spencer. You can see here uh, the commitment or the approach that they've taken towards their commitment. Very quickly, I'd like to point out some auxiliary pages. Um, uh, supply Chain uh, will collect uh, relevant news and resources to truly make the platform a one-stop shop uh, for information on sustainable agricultural commodities. Check back often as uh, we'll keep these updated. Uh, if you have any resource suggestions, please just let us know. Uh, there are more details on the project available in the About section. Um, here on the methodology page, uh, we've outlined our research process. Um, as a project that is promoting sustainability disclosure, we try to live up to the values of transparency and accountability ourselves. Um, at the top of the page, uh, you can use the icon uh, to share uh, uh, these pages with your friends via uh, social media. Uh, be sure to follow us on Twitter at supply underscore change and to like us on Facebook. Finally, 
uh, we invite you to sign up to stay informed uh, when new profiles are released, new functionality is added, and to keep abreast of developments within the community. We do look forward to your feedback as we develop the platform and hope you'll find supply-change.org to be a valuable tool. Thank you very much. Great, and the, the next speaker that we have is Fiona Wheatley from Marks & Spencer. Fiona, over to you. Hello there, um, and I'm assuming that my first slide's up, um, my introductory name. So just to explain that um, I'm responsible for developing the Marks & Spencer strategy for sustainable marine and terrestrial raw materials and supporting the business and implementation of that. So very much a practical um, side of the business. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a brief introduction to Marks and & Spencers and our sustainability program. And then I'm going to share some thoughts on supplychainchange.org and its relative value. So Marks & Spencers, what is Marks & Spencers? We are a very well established um, UK high street retailer. Although increasingly we now have an international presence and we have 400 stores internationally. Our mix is 55% food and 45% non-food. Um, our international profile is primarily non-food, um, largely fashion driven. Um, however, in the UK we, we are particularly well known for our premium food offer. Our company has been operating for almost 130 years. We are the UK's leading clothing retailer, and um, e-commerce is increasingly important to our business development as well with our multi-channel offer. And at the bottom there, I mentioned Plan A, and Plan A is the name of our sustainability program that so far since its inception in 2007, has delivered 5.5 million in savings to the bottom line of the business. So the next slide tells you, um, so Plan A, what is Plan A? It's now known as Plan A 2020, unsurprisingly, another of these um, achievement signposts that were referenced earlier. What is particularly interesting about Plan A is that it is not only a sustainability program, it is also considered a business transformation program. And the point of Plan A is to create an environmentally, socially, and commercially resilient business. So we recognize that as we go into the future and we're looking 10, 20, 50 years ahead, we need a business that is fit to face the challenges of a changing world. We need to be prepared to deal with climate change and changing weather patterns growing populations and changing consumption patterns and diet, and an increasingly resource-strained world. And obviously, as you're all very aware, these are just the headlines. There is an, an enormous range of complexity under each of these um, statements. And Plan A seeks to develop business thinking, planning, and action to be better equipped to face into all of these going forward. And the next slide is merely a small sample of the sort of issues covered by our over 200 public commitments under the Plan A programme. These cover everything from healthy diets to deforestation, from local communities to climate change, and much, much, much more. It is an extraordinarily comprehensive programme, and we've been incredibly fortunate that we've had um, quite unparalleled levels of support from the very top of the business um, to the value that Plan A delivers to not only our brand, our reputation and our profile, but also to core business practice. Focuses on deforestation. And I think it's increasingly important. I think businesses are increasingly recognizing that issues like deforestation really are not a competitive issue. I believe that we're entering a new paradigm where it's recognized that supply chain actors, civil society, financial institutions, and governments all have to work together to find solutions, find solutions to this and many other complex challenges we face. Marks and Spencers recognises 
the critical need to address destruction and degradation of the world's remaining forest landscapes. And we're very aware of the role that commodities such as palm oil, soy, cattle and timber pulp products can play as a catalyst for destruction, but also potentially for conservation and restoration. And we believe that this new energy and determination, which has also manifested itself in the Con Consumer Goods Forum deforestation commitment, the New York Declaration on Forest, and the many other commitments to avoiding or stopping deforestation across business and government, is moving us towards a tipping point where the level of impact of our actions it's going to be manifest in a way that we hope has never been seen before. And I mean that obviously in a positive way. However, we also must recognise that many, many companies remain unengaged. And we have to recognise that those who wish to hold organisations to account do not always have easy access to the relevant information to differentiate the leaders from the laggards. And we believe this is why supplychange.org is so valuable. It makes transparent business commitments and performance. And we believe this transparency is a valuable tool for all stakeholders in holding business to account for the delivery of their commitments. So I've touched already on transparency. And we do see that transparency is an incredibly important trend for business. And it's one that Marks & Spencers wants to deliver well. We are in the middle of reviewing stakeholder expectations to identify what is possible and what is useful to disclose. Transparency is not about all information to all people. Understanding what information is considered valuable by organisations like supplychain.org and their many stakeholders is part of our holistic review. At the moment, feedback indicates that information about our products and their supply chains and information about customer behaviour should be our priority. Should be our priority. And the, this, the, the products, supply chains and customer behaviour is the information considered of the highest value to those stakeholders whom we have engaged with and engaged in research with so far. It is also clear that making information available through independent third party disclosure as opposed to through our own platforms and communication approaches is a very an added value part of Marks and Spencer's approach to transparency. And we really do see this as a key role for supplychange.org. The MS Transparency Program is partly about allowing our own performance to be scrutinised alongside our peers, but it also allows us to view and to compare companies in our upstream supply chain, particularly those with whom we do not have a direct trading relationship. And this is incredibly common in commodity supply chains and very specifically those supply chains which are creating the greatest deforestation. So in summary, Marks & Spencer supports a broader transparency agenda. And we believe the real value is to be found with those organisations or systems that can distill and curate information in a meaningful way. And we really hope that supplychange.org will prove to be a valuable asset in this space. Thank you, Fiona. And thank you, Stephen. And first and foremost, I want to thank everybody who's called in and registered for this uh, very important webinar. We have close to 500 people who have registered in their in respective institutions. Also, I'd like to thank Sustainable Brands, Ecosystem Marketplace, Forest Trends, CDP, and WWF for the very, very hard work you do to green our supply chain. In the remaining two or three minutes that I have allocated to chat, so we can have a couple minutes to, to answer questions afterwards, I briefly want to describe how important supplychain.org is to Calvert. For a little bit of introduction, we'll go. Um, 
Calvert is an asset manager. We are uh, what we call internally a boring mutual fund. So at any one time, we have financial positions in over 7,000 publicly traded companies globally. And we have 5, 000, over 500,000 shareholders. So on a daily basis, our team assesses environmental social governance risk factors for these publicly traded companies. On my desk, I have close to 2,200, that's 2,200 environmental social governance criteria that I can use, and that we use, to frame how we assess and do our integrated financial analysis of the companies we choose to invest in. Yet, fewer than five of these data sources, and data, I'm sorry, fewer than five of these data criteria are for timber, pulp, palm oil, and cattle, the leading causes of deforestation and forest degradation globally. So this is what, so supplychain.org allows us to review palm oil, soy, timber, and pulp, and cattle supply chains. It allows us to benchmark and evaluate and rank companies, and enables us to do you know, high-quality due diligence and decision-making. This matters, as was discussed earlier, because 30 to 35 percent of our global emissions come from agriculture and land use change. And even most and more importantly, the only way we can remove carbon pollution from the atmosphere is through sustainable land use, or as we all studied in fifth grade here in the U.S., photosynthesis. So for us, as a long-term investor with a, with a very specific, responsible, and deep approach to fiduciary, our fiduciary responsibility, we believe that we must look at supply chain criteria for publicly traded companies. So with this, you know, we're very grateful to be part of the supplychain.org beta rollout, and we recommend that other institutional investors and other interested actors and stakeholders and shareholders also look at share, uh, supplychain.org. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, everybody, to all the speakers. Uh, this, is, this has been a great presentation, and, and uh, we appreciate your insights. We are now going to move into a Q&A period. Uh, before we do, there were a couple of general questions that came through on the chat, uh, which I'd like to address quickly, and then I'll hand it over to uh, the presenters to answer some of the more technical questions. Uh, the first is around our launch plan. So as Gabriel just mentioned, this is a beta launch. Uh, of the website, and we have a report that is available to download on the Forest Trends website. If anybody is interested in finding a link to that report, please do contact info at supply-change.org, and we'd be happy to send it to you. Insofar as the launch plans, as this is a beta launch, you will notice that we are covering companies that have made commitments and profiling them on the website. However, not all companies Profiles are available at this time, but they will be rolled out over the coming weeks. And so the long-term strategy is that this will be a constantly evolving, developing, and real-time updating website. Uh, in terms of additional commodities, we are focusing on the current commodities of palm oil, soy, pulpler, pulp and timber, and cattle. So please do check, check the website back frequently. And if you are interested in hearing from us and staying in touch and, and hearing about our developments as they come, sign up for our newsletter, which will have notifications of when new profiles are uploaded and new developments are made. So moving on into the Q&A session, we've had a slew of different questions and we really appreciate you sending those in. We're looking at the clock and we have just under 10 minutes, so we may not be able to get to all of them, but we will try to respond to you all by email to the ones that we did not uh, address on this call. The first question that I would like to present to the, the panelists are, how are traceability commitments being monitored or measured? Is there a traceability standard or tool that is being used? And any of our presenters, feel free to jump in to respond to that question. Uh, 
Uh, hi, so this is Molly from Ecosystem Marketplace. This is probably a good question for our uh, WWF colleagues. Um, I will say that, you know, the purpose of, of this website is to provide transparency around the kinds of commitments that, that are being made and particularly that are being made and reported on publicly. There's another question in here about the level of um, supply chain numbers that we track and, and points out that, um, you know, we see a lot of people at the, the sort of end user end of the spectrum. So retailers, even manufacturers, not so much at the producer end. Um, we mentioned in the report that, you know, the largest increase in new commitments actually comes from the more upstream levels of the supply chain, like producers and traders and processors. Um, however, uh, the commitments from that end of the supply chain are still relatively new, even though they can be very significant um, and, and sizable. So, you know, as producers, traders, et cetera, become more um, more uh, active in, in making public commitments, the more we'll be able to put a line. Um, in terms of traceability specifically and in terms of, of monitoring progress against those commitments, um, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to WWF to capture that response. Sure, thank you. So um, for traceability, while there's not necessarily a standard for it, there are uh, typical practices uh, that are used. There tend to be different uh, types of chain of custody that are used. You have um, three or four in particular that are, that are used the most often. One is called segregation, which is where you have the material constantly traced from its origin through the supply chain. The other one is called identity preserve. Very similar, but it, uh, I'm sorry, I mixed those up. Uh, identity preserve where it's chased through the entire supply chain. Um, then segregation, which is only certified material. And then you have the mass balance approach, which is where a certain percentage of certified material gets mixed in with other materials. The blending process in each of these commodities can cause difficulties, whether it's for the making of paper or blending of oils. Those tend to be the ones that are the most often used. In general, for WWF, what we like to see is people moving toward the more traceable systems. Um, we recognize that things like certificates are good at market entry, but over time, we want to see things move to traceability. So if you have that assurance that the materials you are purchasing and then selling to consumers, it's traceable back to the production, the responsible production on the ground. Um, and just to add one more point to that, you know, because our website is in beta, there's still the opportunity to figure out the right ways for us to at least track these activities. So how companies are, are being held accountable, accountable or holding themselves accountable for different types of commitments like traceability. Um, another interesting topic that, that has been raised in the process of, of review with our stakeholders is what happens when companies, um, when traceability isn't necessarily relevant to a company. Um, these are the types of issues that, that we're still working through trying to best represent on our website. Um, and so, you know, if listeners on this call would love to, would like to talk to us more about their ideas on that topic, we'd love to hear from them. So another question that's just come in is, uh, do you evaluate the quality depth of commitments? For example, how far do commitments go? How far do the commitments get us to where we need to be? Um, so again, responding on, on that question as well. Um, right now, you know, our first step within supply chain is simply to capture the types of commitments being made. Um, there, it, it seems very simple when it's all on paper, um, but it, it's taken quite a process just to be able to create enough harmonization around um, the types of reporting that we were tracking to be able to produce the information that we have. Um, moving forward, we would love to be able to do more evaluative um, analytics on the commitments that are being made, but um, but two points related to that. First is that it's really up to our partners who are more deeply engaged with companies at this point who are, are working more closely on the ground in the case of WWF to evaluate the efficacy of those targets. 
Um, and the second is that you know the information does have to be available. So before we can look at commitments in any depth, companies have to report publicly at greater depth. Um, so I've seen several questions in in the mix about you know whether or not we're going to look at the uh, investment associated with these commitments or the land area impact associated with these commitments or even the volume of, of commodities traded. Um, and we can only report on that information if companies let us. Um, and that means that they report publicly to organizations like CDP or are involved in roundtables where they participate in member reporting. And, and just a reminder, if you are um, not speaking, please put your line on mute. And then I think maybe this, this can also be a question over to Katie McCoy uh, regarding um, evaluation of companies. And do you have uh, the follow-up question to that, Katie, would be, uh, do you have information on the funds to be invested in by each company to achieve the commitment, uh, such as going further to say that um, stating a commitment is one thing, but understanding what the level of engagement is or what is required to meet that commitment. And so that might be a question about your data collection or your, your reporting framework. No, absolutely. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I would say, I mean, echoing previous speakers, obviously traceability is one element and um, companies are monitoring their progress towards these um, traceability commitments um, through our process. But I think while well, commitments are a great first step, I think we all recognize a need for, for action and, and moving along this journey. I would say that on, in the terms of investment into kind of making this a reality, you know, some of the information that we collect suggests that um, companies are very aware that there are opportunities out there to be had for sustainable um, procurement or production of commodities. There is obviously a difference between recognizing the opportunities. I think 90% of our responding companies say, yes, there is an opportunity for us to be able to produce or procure um, sustainable one of these commodities sustainably. And I think we need to recognize that, um, you know, that there is there is a perhaps a gap there. Companies are recognizing opportunities, but perhaps not able to realize, uh, it, or, you know, make re make them a reality. So um, there are some, but that, that's not the mainstream. I think that's still some, an area to to explore. Thank you, Katie. And and maybe just in the interest of time, one final question. This would be for, for Gabriel. Uh, questions have come in around um, if you could quickly explain how you would use this site and particularly how it relates to your understanding that supply chains are financially material. Hello, Stephen, and uh, thank you for the question. Um, so for us, supply chains are financially material because the investors, I mean, sorry, the, inve the companies that we invest in tell us this is the tr this is the way it is um they tell us that climate change and other you know more specific supply chain concerns upstream regarding raw material sourcing impact their profit and loss impact their income statement and are now quickly becoming uh of concern so when I talk to these companies and ask them about their supply chain, this is the information they share with me. Separately, we have a view on climate change that we need to mitigate climate change at Calvert. And so clearly we need to mitigate climate change and do this through uh, you know, increasing photosynthesis, photosynthesis and decreasing supply chain risk for communities, biodiversity, and related to water. Um, so for that, for us, you know, it is in that sense it's it's financially material. I'm I'm not at liberty to discuss like a specific company and its approach to financial materiality and the you know the numbers they've told me in confidence. But what I can describe to you is that this is the first website and tool, more importantly, because it's a tool that's available globally that that is easy to use, where all these different commitments are made available. The different qualities of the commitments are made available, whether it's indigenous people's rights, new, how they're approaching forest dependent communities, uh, their approach to land use, um, and there's a, there's a monitoring component that's published on the website. This itself encourages transparency because all this information is in one place. It's free, which obviously 
no, encourages transparency. And then we can also look at let this information to benchmark performance. So for us, we look at the different companies' benchmark performance, and that informs the type of corporate dialogue we have with these companies as a, as a responsible investor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, it's very insightful and, and, and valuable information for us to hear, as many of us may not be investors on this call. Uh, there was a <clears throat> comment that came in uh, from Fiona on the chat. Fiona, if you're still on the line, would you like to uh, use this opportunity as, as likely to be the final comments, and then I'll I'll wrap up the Q and A session. And uh, since since we're a bit over time. Yes, and um, hopefully your feedback is not too bad. I've tried to switch off here. Um, yes, I think it was a really interesting question around how do we collaborate with our competitors in these issues. And actually, what we've found is that um, there has been quite a strong appetite across, certainly if you look at the kind of northern European re major retail companies, um, we've found that there has been a real desire to collaborate. I think everyone recognises that each company having their own um, approaches, standards, even understandings of these really complex issues is not actually that helpful. It's not. It, it, it takes a lot of capacity and energy from the business itself, and it doesn't necessarily help suppliers because the reality is we often share suppliers if not at a direct supplying level, then certainly upstream. So the more we can harmonize and simplify our RAS, the more we can be a consolidated voice, um, the, the better it is for everyone. And that's represented through um, participation in things like the Consumer Goods Forum and the British Retail Consortium, which are very sectorally focused. But we've also, I mean, m and has initiated and led on quite a number of what I call topical forums. So we have a retail palm oil working group, a retail soy working group. Um, we have a dedicated working group in timber under the BRC, which is actually broader than just British retailers. Um, we also look at specific issues like traceability, and I'm currently leading a collaboration to explore what traceability looks like in palm oil from a retail perspective. So what we do is we have a combination of formal, informal, and ad hoc and temporary um, partnerships to address these issues most effectively and to really to help those businesses who are struggling to understand a lot of this, um, the, the, the kind of language, the, 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 the issues on the ground. There's a lot there for people to get their heads around. So we help to support to that development because we've found it actually helps us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Fiona, for that anecdote. Uh, it's very helpful. And <clears throat> thank you, everybody, for, for joining on to this webinar today. And we realized that we did not get to a couple of the questions that were raised, uh, but we do have your names and, and we'll, we'll, we'll attempt to contact you afterwards. And hopefully we can follow up that way. Uh, I think at this point, because we are over time, we should conclude this presentation. Uh, but I just want to make sure that everybody is aware that www.supply-change.org is now live. The report that was uh, reviewed by Molly earlier in this presentation is available on that website. And if you do need to contact us at any time, feel free to uh, email us at info at supply-change.org. Thank you very much for your time. We look forward to talking to you soon.